On today's podcast, The Lens from Body Cam Bus, we're going to be looking into the incident between Miami Dade police and NFL star Tyreek Hill. Let's get to it. So, Greg, you saw the footage. Give me your perspective on how it all played out. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack on this particular incident. And this really shows the importance of getting that body cam footage released to the public as soon as possible because when you're basing opinions just on a camera phone footage, you're not getting that complete story arc. You're literally just getting the middle and the end, but you're not showing what led up to a cop basically on top of Tyreek face down, handcuffing him in the streets. Um, basically, when you watch, so thank you guys for getting all the, the other camera angles because it really helped me kind of form an opinion. Uh, but the footage starts out with motor officers. Uh, they're stopped on the street. It's an area that's kind of barricaded with these big kind of barrel cone delineators. And I looked it up. They were, um, it was um, Northwest 109th Street, which is the, the surface street that feeds into Hard Rock Stadium where the Miami Dolphins play. Tyreek Hill is a wide receiver with the Miami Dolphins. So they're on their motorcycles. And then all of a sudden you can tell, now I'm going to admit what I'm talking about now is my speculation, just based on my experience as a, you know, a former police officer of 30 years. Uh, but you can see the body cam footage kind of shift to where initially they were more focused um, on the side of the street that they were on. It's a east-west street and their cameras were kind of pointing eastbound. Then all of a sudden they were more focused on the, the oncoming traffic in the westbound lanes. Then you could see the black McLaren going pretty fast, approaching um, where, where the, you know, passing the officers. So then you could see, you know, the officer's camera, he was turning his motorcycle onto that uh, westbound lane and then trying to catch up with Tyreek. Um, the official release from the Miami-Dade police officers, uh, police department is that uh, Tyreek was clocked in his McLaren at going 60 miles an hour. Uh, that stretch of the road, it's a 40 mile an hour um, roadway. So it's posted 40 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour faster than everybody else on the roadway, which that's pretty darn hazardous. I mean, that's, that's reckless in my opinion. Now, one thing I wanna point out, and again, this is where I get into some more speculation, is you see the officers, again, just based on their, their camera, their attention focuses, uh, one, 199, Northwest 199 is, runs east and west. They were facing westbound, but they were kind of shifted over to where their cameras were more looking down the eastbound lanes. All of a sudden, they, you could see that they actually focus more on that oncoming traffic. This tells me that uh, an officer probably down the road down 199, radioed him in, hey, I, I had a McLaren just pass me up, traveling at a very high rate of speed. Now, the motor officers, they're uh, listening through you know, the helmet, so we're not going to hear anything like that from the body cam microphone. So, but that's what I think has happened. So now you can see the motorcyclist, <laughs> he's you know, trying to catch up with, uh, with Tyreek, so I'm sure they're thinking, you know, that's putting them in harm's way, just forcing them to ride like that to catch up. Tyreek pulls over and I use Google Maps to kind of actually the street view to navigate. I located where the officers were and I located where they made the stop. And it was about a little less than a quarter of a mile from where the officers were from where Tyreek pulled over. Um, the officer initially said, pull forward, you know, because I'm guessing he didn't like where Tyreek stopped. It was, you know, and that's what officers will do. If they feel like the stop is being conducted in a kind of a dangerous area, they'll request that the motorist move to a safer area. So he says, pull forward. So Tyreek pulls forward and he pulls over on the side of the curb. Um, and I looked again, I was using Google Maps. It was like the 2300 block of 199th Street. Um, windows up, it's a limo tent. You can't see the person behind the wheel. You can't see what they're doing. And that right away 
he's going to put the hackles on the back of that cop's neck, standing at attention because vehicle stops are extremely dangerous because of the unknown. Um, an officer doesn't know who's driving that car, what their intentions are, what they may have done that led to their erratic driving. I mean, they may have just robbed a bank. I mean, there's all sorts of questions that the cop has running through their head. So they want to be put at ease. The best thing Tyreek should have done was just had that window rolled down, had his hands on a steering wheel so the cop can see his hands and just cooperated with him. Um, in, in the United States, driving is not a right, it's a privilege. And when you sign your signature on that driver's license, one of the things you're promising to do is obey the rules. And the officer is going to ask you for your driver's license, your registration, your proof of insurance. You have no choice. You have to release those documents to that officer. You don't have to talk to the officer. You don't have to you know, tell him why you were driving fast. You don't have to answer any questions, but you do have to release those documents. That's, you, you have no choice. Um, the officer knocks on the window with his finger. You can hear, knock, knock, knock. And then right off the bat, Tyreek rolls his window down and he's yelling at him, stop knocking at my window, stop, stop knocking on my window. The officer is explaining to him, you know, I'm trying to tell you to roll your window down. And again, he's, Tyreek's just obsessing with, stop knocking on my window, stop knocking on my window. He kind of crams the driver's license through a little slit in the window and uh, just basically telling him, here, here, do what you gotta do. I'm in a hurry, I gotta go, I'm late. Um, cop's not done talking to him yet. First of all, the cop wants to make sure he's going to be safe. Keep your damn windows rolled down. And also I'm gonna need your registration and your proof of insurance. He didn't have the opportunity to even ask that. Instead, again, they're in this pissing contest about rolling the windows down or not. Um, ultimately, that the, the, the cop was done. I mean, he was done. He saw that he was, it was, conversation was getting nowhere. There wasn't gonna be a dialogue. Tyreek wasn't going to, you know, obey what he was saying and roll the window down. So he took it upon himself to open up that door. And, um, so let me tell you, there, there's probably two things going on in the police officer's mind as they were pulling that car over. They had two options. One was to just write him a simple ticket for speeding, for excessive speed. Um, again, I truly believe, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, that the speed started way beyond, way before the police officer saw him. And I know for a fact, I mean, think about anybody watching this video, including myself, if you're on the freeway driving and all of a sudden you see a cop in your rearview mirror, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna look down at your speed limit, your, your uh, speedometer. The, the other thing you're gonna do is take your foot off the gas. And I'm, I would be willing to bet, again, speculation on my behalf, Tyreek was probably going way faster than 60 miles an hour so they're walking up on that car with two, two options. One is to write a simple speeding ticket for ex exceeding this posted speed limit. The other would be reckless driving. And uh, reckless driving is, you know, um, willfully driving in a way that's putting others at risk. And I would say driving that fast on that street with, with the amount of traffic that was rolling around and I'm sure, you know, in order to maintain those speeds, he was changing lanes like crazy. Um, that is very reckless in my opinion. And again, that was one of their options. In most jurisdictions, uh, reckless driving, you can write a, well, there's two types. There's misdemeanor and felony. You can, for misdemeanor, which that would have been a misdemeanor, you can write a ticket or you can book. You can put them in jail. And I think what Tyreek did by elevating that contact beyond reason was he flipped the switch in that cop's mind. It's like, okay, now we're going for reckless driving. And on top of that, um, obstructing and interfering a police officer during his duty. I mean, he was, that was a lawful stop. He had every right to write uh, a ticket to Tyreek and Tyreek was behaving in a way which was delaying him. Uh, it's reasonable for the officer to, to tell him to roll, keep his window rolled down for that officer's safety, um, but Tyreek refused. Uh, officer opens the door, 
then he extracts Tyreek out of the car. Um, we can debate on whether that was reasonable or not. Um, one option probably could have been once the door was opened, exp you know, explain to him, look, I'm concerned about my safety. I want to see you while I'm conducting business. We're going to leave this door open. But I think, again, that officer, he was just done. There was no more talking. Pulls him out of the car. Um, was that excessive force? I don't think so. Just based on the behavior that I observed from Tyreek, he's very agitated, very hostile. I think it could be articulated that using force to pull him out of the car was reasonable. Um, once he got him down to the ground, and this is, again, common handcuffing practices for this type of situation is to have the suspect down on the ground. Um, Tyreek was not fighting, but he was resisting. I mean, he was resisting by just not allowing, you know, the officers to pull his hands behind his back. So I don't think too much force was used on Tyreek to arrest him. And again, my opinion is they were in his mind that officer was arresting him for reckless driving and you know, obstructing and delaying the officer. Um, at that point, things were going just out of control because Tyreek had made a phone call and uh, all these other players were on the road seeing this and that's where, you know, cell phones were out. Uh, players were pulling over and getting involved. And you don't do that. Uh, you know, if you're concerned, first of all, they're blocking the roadways with their big old, you know, SUVs. Um, the cops are going to take care of their business first and they're not going to talk to you. It's just the way it works. And they're just creating more chaos there in the, uh, with the program. So we <laughs> questions you see in the comments, they pulled him over because he was black. No, they didn't. They didn't know what race he was. I can tell you that that was a limo tinted. McLaren driving very fast by those officers. They didn't know what race he was. Um, as you watch the uh, videos, the different angles, uh, one of the angles is, again, after he was in custody, an officer was talking to, uh, I'm assuming it was a fellow player of Tyreek's, and he was explaining, um, we stopped, he was driving recklessly before, even before the turnpike. Um, those officers were stopped, again, using Google Maps. They were stopped, it was like a, the 2100 block of 199th Street. They were a half a mile west of the turnpike. So the fact that he said that kind of confirms in my mind that another officer radioed up ahead and told them, hey, we got a McLaren flying down 199 um, in your direction. And so that's why, again, you saw that camera shift. Um, but yeah, it was unfortunate uh, the way it turned out. It didn't have to turn out that way. All Tyreek had to do was just cooperate. He didn't have to agree with anything, you know, but you got to cooperate. You, you, you know, you have to provide those documents. You have to sign that ticket. You're not admitting guilt when you sign a ticket. Um, and then he would have been on his way. Uh, another thing that Tyreek said that kind of you know made me chuckle was um you know he he the officer wanted him to sit down which again it's a very common thing uh it's all about the officer needs control of the scene and you got a you know buffed out athletic looking guy standing there set him down on the curb and so he's asking him to set he's not setting he's and then so the officer is making him sit down again that was reasonable and Tyreek was saying uh, he wasn't going to set because he just had knee surgery. And yet he played an amazing game that day after all this stuff happened. So um, the other thing I heard Tyreek saying during this arrest was, um, you know, you guys were, you're, you were pounding on my window. You're pounding on my window. He was knocking with his finger and that was clear. He wasn't pounding on his window. Um, and again, totally reasonable, knocking on your finger. That's what you do on a car window. Um, so I think this whole incident just wouldn't have happened the way it did, the way it unfolded, had Tyreek simply just 
use some courtesy. The irony is now you see Tyreek standing at a podium and he's asking for accountability. Um, that just makes me laugh. You know, he wants accountability from the police, but he's not taking accountability for this whole incident unfolding the way it did. All he had to do was be courteous. You don't have to kiss their butts or anything, um, but just be courteous. Take accountability. You were driving your supercar on a surface street, the posted speed limit of 40. And by the time they caught up with you, you were going 20 miles an hour faster than you were supposed to be, faster than all the other cars on the roadway. Take some accountability for it. Sorry, officer, sign the ticket. You have no choice. You have to sign the ticket. You're not admitting guilt. You're only promising to appear or take care of the ticket. And then you're done. Then you're in the locker room getting changed out for your game. Um, yeah, it was all unnecessary. And on another note, I don't know if these officers recognized Tyreek if they knew he was a football star, Miami Dolphins. Um, but, it, you know, if he would have just said, I'm sorry, officer, I'm part of the team, I'm running late, I, I just needed to get to the game, and uh, I won't do it again. I, I, I shouldn't have been driving that fast. I won't do it again. Um, I don't know. The, if they were fans, they may have given, given him a break and just said, okay, continue on, but keep the speeds down. Or again, a, a, a ticket, big deal. The guy is a multimillionaire. It's not going to break his bank, you know, but accountability, accountability. Okay, okay. So so are you saying in the States, you know, there, there's, a, there's way more celebrities out there than over here in Canada. If a cop pulls over a celebrity, whether it's an actor or an athlete, do you think that they would have, in general, do cops give preferential treatment to a celebrity? Do they behave a little bit differently if they know that person is someone known to the public? Well, I don't think it's just a thing in the States. I mean, I think, I mean, think of Montreal. You guys have some, you know, professional uh, athletes that are running around Montreal. Um, I, I think it depends on the officer. You know, I would hope they wouldn't give preferential treatment um, just because, you know, someone's famous. Um, but I'm, I, I know what happens, you know, officers can be starstruck. I mean, they're human beings. Um, but one question I would like to ask is, you know, Tyreek walked away from that. He was unhandcuffed and released. Um, if that was me or you or, or Joe Blow, you know, citizen, would they have received that treatment? Um, I would say the answer would probably be no. They would have probably been booked. So I think, you know, um, being famous definitely brings privilege. And, and, you know, we can look at the footage together right now, but there seems to be a point in the video where, or in the arrest, I should say, where one of the officers says, I could actually take you out of the car if I want to. And then he goes, as a matter of fact, get out of the car. It, it, it is my... <laughs> Let's have a look together right now, real quick here. Over here, let's listen to the conversation. Hey, keep your window down. Keep your window down, I'm gonna get you out of the car. As a matter of fact, get out of the car. So right there, at that instance where he says... Keep your window down, I'm gonna get you out of the car. He says, get your window down, I wanna get you out of the car. That, that's what it sounds like. And then he proceeds by saying... As a matter of fact, get out of the car. As a matter of fact, get out of the car. So as someone who's not in law enforcement, it kind of seems like the cop is like slowly getting more and more angry <laughs> with, with this, uh, with Tyreek, you know? Oh, absolutely. You could see the tensions rising in that officer. Um, but again, we, we had this pissing contest going on between the two. The officer's asking, which I, again, I say is a reasonable request, keep your window rolled down. Tyreek's refusing. He's just being very uncooperative. Um, the officer, when he said, roll your window down or I'm going to open your door and you know pull you out, I think at that time a little, a little light bulb clicked in his head. And he's like, you know what? I'm done. This guy's under arrest now. And that's why we saw that unfold. Is it normal to have police officers pulling uh, cars over? Like, let's go, motor, motorcycle officers pulling over drivers and cars? That is a very common question 
when people see multiple officers handling one incident, especially if it's something like a traffic stop. So first of all, I'm willing to bet that all those officers were there working um, the game. They were there to work the game. They were probably there on overtime. And they were all clustered together there on that roadway, you know, when Tyreek flew by them in the McLaren. So they're all going to pull out together. And I think there were, well, I want to say there was like three officers there on motorcycles uh, on 199 there. On a vehicle stop, two officers are perfect because you have the contact officer who's going to approach the driver and take care of business, you know, writing the citation and everything. Then you have the second officer as a cover officer. And they're usually going to post up on the passenger side of the car uh, so they can see in and just keep an eye on the occupants of the vehicle to make sure they're not posing a threat to, to the officers. That's very, very common. And the fact that there were more than two there, it was just because there was more than two officers you know, at the scene there. And then also once it turned into more of a physical encounter, I'm sure someone probably put it out on the air and maybe even requested a supervisor on the scene. So that's why you're seeing more officers. Uh, with all those citizens, you know, the, I, again, I think they were probably all players getting involved. You need those other officers just to keep things contained as well, you know, to keep control of the business they're taking care of at that moment. So again, that was a very chaotic scene. So just imagine if I were to be speeding on a highway and a cop were to pull me over for the exact same situation, what would be the right way for me to behave and deal with a cop to not make sure things don't escalate? Well, as I already kind of mentioned earlier, um, the best thing to do is just realize that the officer is going to be approaching you. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know if there are any weapons in the car. He knows nothing about you. You know everything about you. You know there's a cop out there approaching your car. He's the, you have a lot more information about him than he has about you or, or her. The best thing to do is make sure your windows are rolled down. I mean, when you're, when you're getting, when you see that you're being pulled over, as you're pulling over, just get your windows rolled down. That right away will put the officers at ease. And then just to have your hand, I always tell people, just get your hands on the steering wheel. And so right off the bat, that officer is going to know, okay, this person knows that I'm concerned for my safety and they're putting me at, at ease. So that's going to give you a little bit of favor with that officer. Then once the officer asks you, hey, do you, you know, do you have your driver? I need your driver's license. I always suggest just look at the officer and tell them, it's in my wallet, in my back pocket. Is it okay if I reach for it? You know, you're, you're again, letting them know you're aware of their concerns and, and that's going to, again, bring them down another notch. And then just be polite. A lot of times politeness will get you out of a ticket. Don't argue because the place to argue is in a court, not on the streets. The, the officer already made up their mind to pull you over. In their mind, they have a reason to pull you over and they're going to take some kind of action. The action could be a, a written warning, a verbal warning or a citation. And a lot of times I tell people, the motorist decides on what's going to happen to them. A little courtesy goes a long way. So that's my advice again. And if you feel that, that there's really, you know, this officer's in the wrong, then you can always request that a supervisor rolls and then talk to that, su that uh, officer supervisor. But doing what Tyreek did was a textbook example of what not to do. You could see what happened. Now, one thing I always wonder is how can a cop pull you over for speeding if they don't clock you with a radar gun? Well, there are three ways that an officer can pull you over without uh, hitting you with a a radar or LIDAR, it's actually a laser thing now, um, pacing you. You know, the officer will drive up at the same speed, you know, keeping the same pace as you. So they're not gaining on you, they're not dropping back, and they're looking at their speedometer. Ve uh, police vehicles, whether it's a motorcycle or a car, their speedometers are all calibrated. So they're certified that, that they're accurate. You know, so if, if that speedometer says 55, that officer is driving 55. So that's one way. Another way is a lot of officers have been like anointed as experts. 
uh, especially, you know, going through radar training and everything, one of the uh, things you have to pass when you're being certified on radar is uh, estimating speeds just, you know, by watching the car. Uh, if they're recognized by the court as an expert in estimating speeds, that'll hold. And another way is um, it's a lot of jurisdictions don't allow this for, you know, uh, patrol officers out in, you know, cars or motorcycles. But if you've ever wondered how uh, we have these in California, you know, CHP have, have fixed wing aircraft flying and they're monitoring speeds. And what they're doing is what's called time in motion. So you'll have like a big X painted on the roadway, then like say a couple of miles down another X, they know that it takes X amount of time to go from point A to point B. So if driving the speed limit should only take you, or should say take you 30 seconds, I'm just pulling an arbitrary number out, 30 seconds to get from point A to point B, and they're clocking you at 20 seconds, then they're just going to do the math and they're, they'll know how fast you were going. So time and motion, you know, that's not a real common thing. And very rarely will you see uh, a police officer on the ground using time and motion, but that's how they do it. Okay, Greg. So I guess we'll just have to keep an eye on this case and we'll see how things develop. And I'm sure you'll give us some more insights in the future podcast. Oh, for sure. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Okay. See you next week.